Okay, y'all, I am so excited to have a dear, dear, dear friend on our show again. If you don't remember, go back and listen to the Rockstar episode number 74, and you get to hear me chat with Megan Niskern. Welcome back, Miss Megan. How are you? I am doing really good. And I love that I can just come here and say, can I hang out with my friend? And we get to talk about work and life and it's the best of all the worlds. And also plan a vacation. Oh, okay. Let's do that too. Yeah. Let's yeah. Plan a vacation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, well, I want to just, before we even jump into everything, for those that missed number 74, they're going to go back and listen to it. But I want to kind of share a little bit about you, but then share an update for those that did listen to number 74. All right. So I am a eating disorder registered dietitian, and I have been doing this work since 2008. And I teach full-time at Arizona State University in the dietetics program, of course, some undergrad and graduate uh, program courses. One is eating disorders as well. And so um, recently I started a private practice right in the same month as COVID started, in fact, Wonderful. March. Yeah, I, I'm really, really intuitive in that way. Um, March of 2020, and and I know individuals like you and other colleagues and friends that have created these private practices and been successful, but it was so intimidating for so long for a number of reasons. And it's just going amazingly. I love this work in a way that I always avoided it because I didn't think I would love it. And then in the meantime, I've created an online training available with a really kind of wide spectrum look at what is missing in our dietetics education right now, as it refers to understanding how mental health impacts food and body, and then really starting to understand how to come from a weight inclusive lens of providing care. So lots of things. I, I, I'm going to stop talking now. You are not sleeping is what it sounds like. <laughs> it's true. I don't sleep. I actually work on the couch in my bedroom and that's where everything happens. <laughs> I love it. And hopefully somebody is bringing you yummy snacks while you're just like pounding away at the computer. <laughs> that, it is. It does happen a little bit like that. My husband checks in and goes to bed and he's like, what do you need? More water? Do we need Aww. something to eat? Yeah. He's been great. <laughs> I love it. Okay. I want to know all about this new course because there is such a huge gap in the dietetic education for mental health. So tell us, like, give us all the goodies. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And so it is a 14.5 CEU online self-paced training that includes videos. It's closed captioned as well. It has the printed visual materials and a number of other additional support items on top of the 10 hours of lecture Holy that's incorporated. <laughs> so it is really what I have seen through my work since 2008 of what I feel was missing from my master's level dietetics education. And now, you know, the six plus years that I've been full-time at Arizona state, we have a huge DPD program. I'm in it. I teach in it. And I can see where we just continue to miss the mark. And the cool thing that's happening though, Adrian, is the students are looking for this information now. Mm. They're coming into dietetics, they're coming into nutrition, they're coming into food service, they're coming into, you know, nutrition, health, entrepreneurship, and they have awareness that the way things are going traditionally are maybe not working as well as we thought they were. That makes my heart so happy to hear like the, the ones that are coming up next are just so interested in this. So we hear that there's lots of training and like eating disorder, eating disorder, eating disorder, like, cause that's like the hot topic right now. So what's, what am I going to learn when I jump into your course? Yeah. So I, would have loved to have done another eating disorder one, but there are, you know, there are a couple of good ones out there and I don't need to go reinvent that wheel. However, I think, and this happens within eating disorder, there is co-occurring. It is not a standalone condition for almost everyone. Let's just say, <laughs> let's just be real <laughs> anxiety, depression already. We've got co-occurring, you know, uh, happening if we've got eating disorder pre presentation. So I thought I would take it and look at it more comprehensively. 
And so I don't give extensive deep dives into eating disorder, but I give a great overview of eating disorders, disordered eating, how those are different, how those are similar. We get into substance use disorder, which has such a strong co-occurring correlation. So if you struggle with substance use disorder, you have up to a 60% chance of also having eating disorder or disordered eating. It's the other way. You have an eating disorder, 30 to 40% chance. You also have co-occurring substance use. And then we have to understand general mental health. It's food is attached to our mood. Food is attached to our physical um, presentation in the moment. Food is talked about all the time in our society in ways that are confusing and concerning. And we don't, we still in our dietetics process don't educate as well. I talk in my training about this linear way of thinking that, oh, I see a problem. Oh, this data supports the problem. Oh, let's fix just that problem. And <laughs> Right? Does that kind of feel familiar, Adrian? Oh like, my gosh, I'm giggling because I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. It'd be this, check the blood sugar, then this, and then you do this, and then they should be fixed. And then you just give them the suggestions on what foods are good and bad, and then they leave. What? <laughs> <laughs> and everybody wonder why you feel like a failure as a dietitian. You're like, I gave them the handout. Why aren't they better? No. And it made a lot of sense. There was good pictures, and we thought really clearly, and we... No, these are people, it's complex, it has perspective, it has nuance, it has, you know, lived experience, access, cultural influences, understanding, um, ability. There's just about a bajillion other things that need to be considered. Just that. <laughs> and so I don't think we feel confident as dietetics educators in the realm of a conversation, a discussion, moving outside of that literal narrow scope we kind of create about data and numbers and asking about things like, how well do you sleep at night? How restful are you when you're sleeping at night? You know, what goes on when you eat? Do you eat alone? Do you eat with other people? Do you eat distracted? Do you eat fast? I currently am working with a client who is excessively standing and then walking after meals, right? And so there's so many things that you don't think to even ask about and the way we're, I don't want to say trained, but maybe even educated. Oh. And so we have to change it. Totally. I, 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 as you're saying that I had, uh, I was talking to some of my dietitians and we were talking about like, Oh, I just don't understand what's going on with this client. I, I mean, they eat normal and I'm using air quotes. Oh, they had a sandwich. I was like, well, did you ask how much of the sandwich you ate? And like, what does your sandwich look like? My sandwich looks different than your sandwich. And they're like, I never even thought of that. When somebody says a sandwich, I assume I was like, that's just so it's normal. And that's what we were taught. And so how do you I, like, so from what I'm hearing, like you're kind of helping dietitians to really dietitian better. <laughs> dietitian better hashtag hashtag dietitian better. Yeah. Um, I know, but honestly it I'm hoping because while it's, I, you know, it's called deep in your perspectives, uh, nutrition therapy for mental health. And it really is geared towards what every dietitian needs to know. So I think when we think of, you know, the realm of eating disorders, we look at it as a specialty and yes, to treat it is a specialty to engage in supporting someone in their recovery is a specialty, but eating disorder behaviors and prevalence is going to walk into every area of dietetics, nutrition, food service, it's, you're not going to avoid substance use disorder in clinical in renal in public health, like any of these arenas, all of this is there and we observe it as medical conditions. And yet we think we can treat it that way. And we have to treat it as human experiences. And so while this training gives emphasis for providers that want to go in that direction in dietetics or nurses or therapists that want to learn more about what the role is, it is really a foundational way for every dietitian to have an enhanced learning. And so I kind of thought of this, of this as a class. This is the class that is essentially missing from our required DPD courses. So here's your you know, almost 15 credit 
semester <laughs> and I'm going to give you what you need as a missing piece. And so if you want to know more about eating disorder, start here and then go to the eating disorder realm, right? If you want to do more substance use or more behavioral health, psychiatric care, mental health, start here and then head in that direction. But this is a sound foundation of just how to bridge what we already know with a, bit, a greater scope of practice. I talk about that regularly too. And it's interesting, like I'm thinking back to when I was like, in school baby dietitian or thinking about being a dietitian like i was just like uh mental health like oh i don't i don't i don't even know or substance use like oh like uh i was so intimidated unsure of just because it wasn't my lived experience and so i think and i hope like i wonder if this next generation has had more experience possibly going through the pandemic and having their own lived experiences but i wonder how to continue to have that conversation at, and bring it to more awareness that, oh, dietetics is a key factor of mental health. You bring up so many good points, Adrian. <laughs> I, think, I think what you're talking about too is like, you know, that decade ago, it was- Decade, I, ah! I know, sorry. I was like trying not to age us as I was even thinking about how I'm gonna answer I'm glad you it was just a decade and not like multiple right. decades. <laughs> 15 years ago, yeah. but you know, um, but the truth is, is how far we've even come in the stigma orientation and availability of mental health services. When I started, I started at a treatment center for women in eating disorders. We were still just treating women. And so think of how far we have come in the time frame mm -hmm. of the last decade plus. So I think a few things are happening. One, I think there is more lived experience awareness, prevalence that gains interest in going into this arena. And I think more people are generally speaking, getting help. And because the increase in treatment centers um, continues, and yet we know that through the pandemic, as you mentioned, the sharp rise in particular for adolescents and young adults mm -hmm. needing to receive care and support uh, that occurred really brought to life the disruption oh, yeah. in our food and our eating and our, yeah. Totally. And it's interesting too, like I was thinking of like how mental health is like normal now or like seeing a therapist is normal now. Quote, normal now. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like, oh yeah. Like it's normal to have a therapist. Thanks Sopranos and Ted Lasso for like having everybody have a therapist. Um, <laughs> so how can we get dietitians a part of like that? I was like, I don't know if dietitians would be that sexy on Ted Lasso, but like challenge accepted. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is such a great point. Why is there not a dietitian walking around with Keely, just like as yes. the BFF of Keely? Um, um, any, any insert any gender role there. Just give me a dietitian, best friends with Keely, comes in, helps support the team. I think it's so true. And honestly, I, this is how I also now kind of envision dietetics in a certain way. How did the dentist? navigate their way into convincing all of us that we need to go twice a year. Now I'm sure there's data that supports this, but why not have two guaranteed dietary sessions as well checks every single year? I, man, oh my right? gosh, I've been saying this, this for like a decade. Go. <laughs> and so if we're dietitians that don't just see ourselves only fitting into the spaces of clinical, of, you know, public and mental, or sorry, public and community health and food service and sports dietetics, if we see ourselves as being food helpers, as food nourishers, as check-ins, you know, around what's going on or how am I feeling and not, I, I think we kind of originally inserted ourselves as like dictators of food and we need to be seen more as consultants, like therapists, mm -hmm. counselors around food. Mm -hmm. This work isn't, a, you know, this work is about helping an individual to identify areas that are not serving them, mm -hmm. not me inserting what I think is or is not going to serve them. It's me helping them to navigate what mm. that looks like. And we aren't taught that. We're I, I was, yeah. I was thinking the same thing. I was like, yeah, like let's do it. But then I'm like, oh, bless. Like we don't have that training to really be able to sit down uh, and really help somebody like, uh, we just hired a whole bunch of dietitians and, uh, some of the feedback we got from them is like going from inpatient to really counseling 
is a culture shock as a dietitian. You got to spend an hour in front of a stranger and have them talk about an embarrassing aspect of their life that they don't know how to do and not be non-judgmental and be supportive. Like we didn't get zippity doodah training in that. Oh, heck no. And so I actually spent a good deal of time talking about the initial assessment, what can be added when it's appropriate to add certain things and how initial assessments should be different. For instance, if I am in an eating disorder environment, or if I advertise as an eating disorder provider and you come to me for that, I will give you a completely different assessment tool that is specifically looking at eating disorder esque behaviors and, uh, you know, correlations. If I am in substance use disorder, or if that has been given also same, you know, if it's mental health in general, I will do a combination of all those. So, and if it's general clinical, if it's general private practice, that doesn't mean you avoid it. There are subtle ways to incorporate some screening without saying, so do you eat large amounts of food and then purge them intentionally? <laughs> if your person came in for a cardiac consult and you ask that abrupt question, they're going to be a little thrown off, right? <laughs> I try to educate on the context and that that is really important. There are certain areas where you can dig a little deeper and what does that look like and what information is deeper, air quote. Um, but also awareness of questions that you can insert into your current area of practice to do better at screening mm -hmm. and to do better at gaining awareness and then to refer or to, you know, offer up additional services and support when things are showing up of concern. I remember when I was first starting to counsel patients and like terrified um, and feeling I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. And I got so stuck in my own head that I had to ask the most perfect question. And if I, and I would like read it and like, was just like head down, not even engaging. And so I would just miss the mark and then be so stuck in my own head. So how do you like really help dietitians to not get stuck in that perfect question route and really be present? So I talk a lot in the training actually about not making assumptions. So hold space. You don't have to do it perfectly. You're going to make some mistakes along the way that you'll learn from and that your authenticity, your awareness, your ability to listen, and then gain skill sets and how to probe and how to ask is the growth that we need to be having as providers. And it happens slowly. Think Adrian, how many mistakes you made when you look back on the beginning of your <laughs> uh, career. I, yeah. have a, I have a couple of doozies that I wish I could find people and send them an apology letter. Like, I am so sorry I put you through that horrible group where I told you how many calories are in a pound. What was I thinking? And oh, yeah, I and, think I talked about gluconeogenesis to somebody. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Yeah. I'm sure that absorbed well, right? Yeah. <laughs> but, but it wasn't that it was a failure. It was an intentional, purposeful way of offering support that I, in that moment, intensely learned from and then never did again. And so what I really offer up is this idea of not having to be perfect to doing the best you can, staying informed, not making assumptions, letting the client take you in the direction that the information goes mm -hmm. and um, being curious. We talk a lot about being curious and that avoids judgment, which contributes to assumptions. So um, I think that's really where it stands. And the other thing I offer is, is we don't have to have all the answers. You don't need to know the answer in the moment. You don't have to figure it out right now. You can always say, wow, I haven't thought about that. Or I do need to think about that. Or I need to learn more about that. Let me get back to you. Mm -hmm. I, you know, been doing this for a long time, but there are still moments. I'm like, what'd they just say? I need to go look that. I have, I have no idea what they're talking about right now, you know? And, and, um, I still have moments where I'm a little bit like, should I know what that is? you know, but there's other moments where I recognize I can't know it all. And I am not going to expect myself to. So I'm going to do my very best. I'm going to continue to educate and grow. And of course I talk about supervision because as you and I know, it's like the Holy grail, I think of what 
has come out of the realm of eating disorder care and practices related to dietetics because it's starting here supervision as a regular part of professional growth and support and um, practices if that could move into all areas of dietetics I think it would just be abundantly wonderful. Oh, totally. And it, it was, I'm so glad like oh, you are like read my brain all the time. I love it. Um, as you were talking, I had, uh, one of uh, my dietitians, she said she uh, was a pediatric, is a pediatric expert who worked in the genetic department of the hospital. She came over to our practice and she said, you will feel incompetent. I feel incompetent until you don't. And the only thing that made me not feel incompetent was supervision. And I was like, you know, genetics, like, how do you feel incompetent? And it was one of those, like just sitting and being able to hold that space and not put your own stuff into a session. It takes practice and it takes that outsider supervisor to really know and how to walk you through that. And I mean, Adrian, think of the number of spaces, like even during your internship where you went and it was a solo dietitian working by themselves that day. And yes, other dietitians may work in that space, but they don't necessarily collaborate or work together. Or they're both busy. There wasn't a ton of times where I saw like lots of dietitians collaborating. And so you do all this extensive education, training, internship tests, and then they just send you out. And they expect you to find and land a job with all this wide range of information and knowledge. And I mean, I agree. I was lost. I found eating disorders as I stumbled in the door, you know, like literally, literally just imagine me falling into the door and they're like, <laughs> you're pretty great. Want a job? And I was like, sure, I'll give this a try. Like it, it was completely. Yeah unintentional. Oh yeah. I raised my hand at a meeting. Somebody's like, oh, we need some eating disorder help. I'm like, I guess, I don't know. This is my calling, I guess. I think. Sure. I, I don't know. I had a, a piece of paper from school about what an eating disorder was. Yes. Yeah. A piece of paper, you know, and most people will joke or talk about the fact that they had one lecture one day on eating disorders. It's typically in your counseling class, which is a decent place to put it, it, it you know, but it's, it needs more than a class. It, it needs more than a lecture, I guess I should say. Yeah. And therefore what that really also does is it kind of minimizes the presentation or the need to understand it in a really strong way. And if we're now, I feel like there's a big wave of a shift into the focus of mental health as a bigger part of our healthcare well-being process. And I talk about that. I talk about how we as dietitians can be fundamentally involved in helping them to see other areas that aren't working well. If I ask the question about sleep, I'm not asking it because I am now a sleep expert. I'm asking it because sleep is connected to nourishment and being nourished and having restful sleep have correlations that are important. Going to bed hungry regularly is important to understand waking up in the middle of the night to eat or be hungry. People may not just disclose this to you unless you ask them these questions. And also, if I see their sleep disturbances, I may suggest, have you had a sleep study? Have you ever talked to anybody about these sleep disturbances? Can we talk about medication so I can just understand? And I can also look at, wow, you're not nourishing yourself throughout the day. You're really restrictive and you go long periods of time between eating. And I'm wondering if that's contributing some to the restlessness at night. So there's just ways that we can further explore and expand the impact of food without having to focus on veggies and more fiber and more color and more organic. It can be behaviorally looking at what are their trends and what is their knowledge and understanding? And I, I just understanding all that from our education process isn't going to happen when you're working in a facility all by yourself each day, doing the same thing. We have to collaborate. We need, you got to thrive. You got to have community to thrive. Don't we know that? Have we, we yeah. learned that? Yeah. <laughs> like, man, how come dietitians forgot to do it with their own profession? Come like, on, y'all. It, <laughs> yeah. it is, it is, it is really, it's unfortunate. And 
the dietetics education is rigorous. I still every day see these students and they're committed and they're working hard and they know it's competitive and they want in, they want the edge. And then I also look at it and I'm like, gosh, they could be so much better prepared, which is, you know, why I include weight inclusive, inclusive understanding and work in all of my classes, why I include eating disorder education in all my classes, um, why I include understanding perspectives and lived experience as a bigger part of how they operate as professionals. And, um, just trying to offer up a bigger, wider lens for them to look at this work through and also recognize you don't, there aren't just five jobs and um, there's about 5 million jobs. And there's so many areas, as you've already mentioned, where we could be putting ourselves into the mix too. And that mix is not medical nutrition therapy necessarily. And I, I, I just love that you are wanting more and more uh, dietitians to understand mental health. And this training is just going to be so helpful. I, don't, I mean, mental health touches every area of dietetics. If you're an oncology dietitian to a pediatric dietitian to any, any type of dietitian you want to be, food service dietitian, mental health is a huge part of all of it. This is just so exciting. So Megan, how can we learn more about your training, more about you and oh yeah, about becoming a supervisee of you? <laughs> oh, so everything is really available through my website, which is wonderful. And that's just Mac, M-A-K-R-D.com. Um, so you can link to uh, working with me for supervision. I offer some monthly packages and I do groups, but I also do one-on-one. -on -one. And then there's links right there to the access to the online training. As I mentioned, it's uh, approved for 14.5 CEUs for all dietitians and diet techs that are registered through the commission on dietetic registration. And then Instagram is really the only social media platform that I engage with, <laughs> but you can find me there at Megan Niskern, um, K N I S K E R N. And yes, I love connecting and I just am so passionate about our field and I love this work so much. So please just reach out. Oh, I want to mention one more thing. Oh, yeah. I started a little newsletter. Um, I call it munchies. And so I send it um, just two out a month. This is geared more for professionals. I include new research and links to new research. I also include upcoming free webinars and CEU opportunities for mental health in general, just to continue to allow space for providers to keep learning for free. It is. A, I gotta say, I love your newsletter. I send it to all of our dietitians because it is just such a great, wonderful resource. So thank you for putting that out because it is a really good, uh, just digestible munchie. Um, we will put all of your information on our show notes. But before we leave, I always ask all my guests, we got to take an action item to move ourselves uh, personally, professionally forward. So what is something everybody listening can do this week to move themselves personally or professionally forward? Ooh, I love that question. As I'm sitting here with my 2021 planner and my 2022 planner laid out in front of me. I love like planners. Talk dirty. dirty. Oh, I Dude, love it. I know, I know you do. That's why I had to tell you. They're so pretty. Um, so I really learned through this training and I posted something actually recently about this. If you have an idea, start it now. I put it off for a really long time, or I would just jot down notes thinking I'll get to it. And it took me longer to do than I had hoped. It was more involved than I thought it would be, but not so much so that I quit, you know? And so I wish I would have just started it and not put it off as long as I did. And I think that was, that's what I would give you. If you've got something that you are thinking about, just take that first step and just start it and see what comes of it. It changes, it grows, but it got better. So I think that's what I would say. Just, just get started. Just get started. I love that. Oh, Megan, this has just been such a delight. Oh, I love hanging out with you. I can't wait to see you in real life. Ooh. I know. Me too, Adrian. <laughs> thank you so much for having oh, me. Oh, thank you. Bye. Bye.